So for our prayer request for today, um, he said Lynn thinks she, she may have a broken wrist, a cracked wrist, but um, she went in her car to Galesburg, right? Yep. So. Somebody else drove. Yeah. Yeah. No, she drove with her feet. Yeah. <laughs> So let's keep Lynn in our prayers. Um, we also got prayers for rain to get rid of this drought. Um, for the family of Jody Glenn Patrick, former Bushnell resident. Um, Dan asking for prayers for his older brother. His wife passed away after two years of fighting all types of infections after breaking her hip. Um, Karen Powell, actually the aunt's in ICU in Bloomington and critical. They cannot operate on a compound fracture due to the status of her kidneys and she's losing blood. Um, and Heather and Dennis failed adoption on Tuesday. And actually put on here and says, my heart hurts and Satan is attacking. He's powerless. You know why he's attacking? Look what we're doing next week. He's just trying to make you down. For those who don't know, next week we will be doing a baptism. RJ is going to be baptized. And we've got another praise here. Addie signed her internship. Hair. Did you? Hair. Yeah. Over in Peoria. So it means she's going to be working stiff and compare mom and dad. Let's hope. <laughs> And praise for our Sunday school. We I, may have got a little off topic today. Yeah, but I'd just like to invite everybody to our Sunday school class. I think we have a really good time there. We learn a lot about people in the church. And I really would like to invite everybody to come at least one time to Sunday school. Yes, we learn a lot about you people that aren't here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But no, it's usually a short video and then discussion, and the discussion goes full circle, yeah. usually. And then I get off topic, and so, but it is a really good time, and it's more of a family atmosphere, the way it should be, because we're here as family and a community to worship God. And I notice there's no prayer request here, but keep my boy Phil in your prayers. We need to get you going, buddy. We got jobs for you. Good <laughs> luck <laughs> there. <laughs> oh, when you retired, you retired, didn't you? <laughs> so, if you'll join me in prayer. Merciful, gracious God, thank you for the beautiful day you've given us. You've given us a glimpse of spring, a glimpse of renewing and rebirth. As I noticed the Lord driving yesterday, all the new calves being out in the feedlots. And the rebirth and that's why we're here Lord to be reborn to be reborn in spirit to be reborn in truth to try to be an example to this world of who you want us to be what you create us for you create us to worship you and as we come into this worship service Lord we ask that it be a blessing to you because you alone are the only one worthy of glory, honor, and praise. Let us not trouble our minds with the problems of the world. We know these things must happen, but it hurts our heart, Lord. It hurts us to see such strife, fighting, and needless death. The only thing we can pray, Lord, is soften the hearts of your enemies. Let them find you. Let them see the truth of who you are and what you are. Give us strength. Give us guidance. Give us the ability to stand firm in your word, no matter what attack is coming. And most of all, Lord, be with those who aren't here. Be with Butch and Loretta as they travel. Be with Jamie and Lissa as they struggle. 
be with Lynn, and hopefully it's just bruising. Be with others who are sick. Comfort those who are mourning. Comfort us, especially those who have younger children, because you look at the future and you don't know what it holds. But the one truth is, the future holds one thing, that is you. Those who are in you have nothing to fear. And Lord, until the day of your glorious reappearing, we will proclaim your name. That you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I got 10 minutes <laughs> for a 40 minute sermon. Huh? I can talk fast, but then people always tell me you talk way too fast. And then I look over and Dan's going. <laughs> so, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 27. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. We are one body with many members. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jew or Greek, slave or free, all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. And that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body we think less honorable, we bestow great honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked, that there may be no division in the body. But the members may all have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. So, since I did baptism last week, and as I said, we have many de different denominations coming here today. So, what is the difference between Protestant Christianity and Reformed Christianity? And this doesn't matter if you've been in the faith for a long time or if you're new. Protestant Christianity is a movement that goes back to the 16th century. Some Christians began to protest against the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. Instead, these believers wanted to return to the teachings found in the Bible. And that in turn led them to reject traditions of the Roman Catholic Church. This new way of thinking eventually became known as Protestantism, protest. Reformed Christianity is an extension of that, though it does have some differences. First, Reformed Christians put a greater emphasis on studying and understanding Scripture. This means they often focus more on interpreting Scripture than just reading it. Furthermore, Reformed Christians believe God works through His people in all aspects of their life, including politics and social justice, rather than just being limited to religious matters. In short, both movements are rooted in similar beliefs and teachings from Scripture that differ in their interpretations and their applications of these beliefs. Nevertheless, we find common ground between all Christian denominations 
by focusing on one thing, our shared belief in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. No matter which denomination we choose, we must strive for unity based on the love of one another and the truth in God's Word. In the 16th century, you had church reformers like John Calvin, Heinrich Bulliger, John Knox, and Huldrych Zwing Feely. This faith emphasizes the sovereignty of God, human depravity, and salvation through grace alone. And these are the four critical as aspects of Reformed Christianity. Predestination. This belief holds that God has already predetermined who will be saved and who will be damned before birth. Total depravity. Reformed Christians believe that God created humans perfectly, but they have become completely corrupted by sin. As a result, they cannot save themselves. Only God can redeem them through his grace. The sovereignty of God, this doctrine states that God controls all things and nothing happens without his permission or knowledge. He is ultimately responsible for both good and evil in this world. That salvation is through grace alone. This teaching asserts that salvation can only come from God's grace. It can't be earned or deserved by any person's actions or their merits. It also affirms that no amount of good works can make up for past sins. Only repentance and faith in Jesus Christ can bring about forgiveness and eternal life. And the Bible alone is the authoritative word of God for our lives, not church tradition or what church leaders said. Reformed Christians also emphasize obedience to God's commands to show gratitude for his grace and mercy. <laughs> so, the historical context of Protestant Reformed Christianity it goes back to the Reformation in the 16th century to reject the practices and the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church because those have become corrupt over time. There was a huge religious upheaval over Europe. People were ready for a change. And they began to question long-held doctrines and traditions that were not supported by Scripture. Martin Luther, in his 99 Thesis, John Calvin rose up during this period, each had different ideas about how to reform the church. But there were core principles. Sola Scriptura. Scripture is the sole source of Christian doctrine. Reformers held to spread their teachings throughout Europe and beyond. So yet Protestantism and Reformed Christianity, the branches of Christianity, and both were growing. It's funny they have the roots in the same movement, but there's also key differences today. Protestants reject certain doctrines embraced by Reformed Christians, such as predestination, infant baptism, but other groups can trace their origins back to the same people in history today. And we can find the distinctions between them that still exist today. You'll find out as we go through this we kind of crisscross back and forth because we are part of the restoration movement. So here's the central beliefs. Let's start with the nature of God. Both Protestants and the Reformed believe in one all-powerful creator. However, they differ in terms of understanding his power. Protestant Christians focus on God's omnipotence, his ability to do anything that he pleases. Reformers emphasize God's omniscience, his perfect knowledge, and his understanding of everything. Protestants believe that Jesus was sent as a teacher and a spiritual leader. Reformers assert that he is the sovereign ruler over all humanity. Protestants emphasize free will and individual responsibility for finding salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Reformed Christians embrace predestination. The belief that God's already chosen who will be saved before they are born. The key difference is that we can shed light on certain churches that have chosen different paths when it comes to matters regarding faith, doctrine, and practice. 
But it is important to remember that no matter what denomination you identify with, what type of church you attend, we are all united by our shared belief in a loving God who desires us to live abundantly through his grace and mercy. The structure of the church is a big one also. Protestant churches are typically led by a single pastor or minister who has authority over the congregation's decisions. Yeah. <laughs> Reformed churches are usually led by an elder board which comprises several individuals appointed by church members to make decisions about doctrine, worship practice, and finances. In Reformed churches, lay people have more authority than in Protestant churches, where typically only ordained clergy have any say in the church matters. Now there's similarities in their core beliefs, but when it comes to how the church runs, it's a lot different. Scripture authority. Protestant Christianity believes the Bible is the sole source of authority for understanding Christian teaching and principles. They believe that faith must be based on personal interpretation of Scripture and that humans can interpret God's will through the words of the Bible. <coughs> Reformers take a slightly different stance when it comes to authority. They believe the Scripture contains all of God's truth but no single person can comprehend it all due to its complexity and depth. Reformed Christians emphasize a communal approach to understanding Scripture rather than individual interpretation. They believe that by gathering together as a church community, they can better understand God's message to us. Protestant Christianity values personal interpretation over traditional teachings. Reformed Christianity leans more towards tradition as an aid in understanding scripture. Tradition sometimes helps them interpret difficult passions in a lot of their history and context as one big church body, allowing them to form their interpretations without relying on someone else's opinion or ideas about the Bible. So we can see how they view scripture differently. Each has its own beliefs regarding how best to understand God's word. Although there are similarities, these differences are important consideration when you try to decide which path to follow for faith is right. Theology is the aspect of any religion based on their belief system that define our relationship with God. Protestants emphasize salvation through faith alone. Reformed Christians focus on salvation through Christ alone. In addition to the difference in their beliefs, there are other distinctions also. Protestants adhere to the teachings of Calvinism, while Reformed Christians focus on the five solas. Sola Scriptura, by Scripture alone. Sola Fide, by faith alone. Sola Gratia, by grace alone. Solo Christo, through Christ alone. And Solo Day Gloria, for God's glory only. These are the big difference between the core, between Protestants and the Reformed Church. Hopefully this helps us understand certain beliefs about our faith and how we view our relationship with God. Understanding theology can be difficult, but if we continue to study, it can help us further appreciate both denominations' unique perspectives on Christianity. The Protestant Church recognizes two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism is a symbol of faith, representing Jesus' death and resurrection. The Lord's Supper remembers Jesus' death on the cross through the bread and the juice. We can remember his sacrifice and renew our commitment to follow him through those sacraments. The Reformed Church has two sacraments. Baptism and communion. Baptism in this church is seen as a sign of God's covenant with us. While communion is celebrated as a reminder of Jesus' sacrifice. In addition, the Reformed Church emphasizes there's a spiritual significance of baptism more than its physical aspects. Protestants focus more on the physical nature of baptism. 
The difference between them concerning sacraments lies in how each view their meaning and their importance. Protestants say these symbols remind them to live in obedience to God's will. Reformers say this represents their union with Christ, which helps them grow closer to him. Both recognize that these sacraments are powerful opportunities to show both gratitude for what God has done for us and an understanding that we need him in our lives every day. So no matter which denomination you belong to, it is clear that these two sacraments are important elements of a healthy relationship with God. I'm going to skip all this stuff. There's a big difference on the role of women in the church. Um, education comes through study. Protestant churches primarily seek to explain their knowledge for its own sake. While Reformed Christians see education as a means to understanding God's will and fulfilling His purpose for them in His life. I will say, as a Restoration Church, as if you notice, we're crossing both sides here on some of our beliefs. There's a word I want to leave you with here, and this is where I'm going to close with this one, then I got a little snippet. Eucanism. ECU. M E N I S M. Eucumenism. Okay, it is the attempt to bridge the gaps between the denominations by sharing ideas, cooperating together on projects, celebrating each other's belief. It's a way for members of different denominations to learn from each other, even without agreeing on every point. As a result, we can then can accept one another as fellow believers in Christ Jesus without compromising our own belief. At the core, it involves respecting diversity among Christians, all while striving for a greater unity. We strive to remember that we're all part of one body in Christ, and there are many ways to express our faith in Him. And Eucanism allows us to do this without judging or condemning others who may not share our beliefs. It also encourages us to focus on what we have in common rather than what divides us. The love of Christ and his sacrifice for us. It allows us to continue to grow together in faith and understanding towards one another. It helps us see beyond the labels and to recognize Christ in each other. Therefore, we can become the unified body of believers working together for one thing, his glory. So we must remember at the end of the day, we're all children of God. Regardless of what our denomination or faith tradition is. Therefore, we should each seek to embrace each other's differences while also recognizing how alike we are. I hope that exploring this didn't bore you too much and helps us to understand the similarities and the differences between denominations. And together, we need to come together and unite in proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, no matter our religious affiliation or our background. Luke 2, verse 8. If anybody follows the, what's his name? David, I just lost it. Uh, Trent Tribe, I think is his name. He's a preacher out of Georgia. He posted this and it just floored me. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news, a great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born in this city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, 
Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste. They found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw this, they made it known that the saying had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. <clears throat> he was reading this with his kids and his grandkids. The question posed to him by the grandkids. What about the sheep? What about the sheep? The shepherds left their flock. They left the 99 to find the one. The one that can save them. The one who can protect them. That's where they went. Did the angels watch over those 99 that were out there? Who knows? But the shepherds did as they were told. They went and found the one. The one who gives peace. The one who protects. The one who can save. And if you haven't found the one who can save, next week we're going to have a baptism. Hopefully we see a life change. Looking forward to it. So if anybody else is thinking about it, they have not made a public confession and been buried in Christian baptism, this would be the time. Let's do it too for you. Unless you want to wait for Easter. I've never done an Easter baptism. There you go. Oh, yours? Yeah. Yours don't count because the water's still black. The water's still black, Joey. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I forgot about yours being on Easter. I, I'm still traumatized about how fast you threw yourself backward and I just can't catch you. So, but any questions about this? Talk to Steve Grigard. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I just want us to be more aware. There's more common between all our denominations than what we think at times. And it's all to glorify God and to be unified in one body of Christ. So Bob's going to sing our hymn of invitation on Les Lonesome. What do you sing? I can. Yeah. If you'll please stand and turn your hymn to 329. If you just don't want to sing, just move your lips. But we all know this song anyhow. And say watermelon, watermelon, watermelon. <laughs> but the Savior is waiting, and He's waiting for you. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let Him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to Him? Time after time is waited before, and now he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open the door. Oh, how he wants to come in. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words to us. Thank you that you've taught me this week how we are all to work together in unity together. How we are all one body in you. And our sole goal is to be like those shepherds. To go and tell. And share the message of your goodness. And the message of your salvation. So as we go, Give us something to think about. Let us ponder on it. Roll it around, Lord. Protect us and guide us. Comfort us. Direct us. Until we come together again as one big family. We thank you for your love. In the name of Jesus, who is the Christ. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the 
Praise Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.